For this video, I'd like to talk about square root equations and how we can graph them. And what you can see is that I've started with the parent function, y is equal to the square root of x. And I say it's the parent function because this is essentially the simplest square root equation that we can create. And if you're ever unsure about how to graph a function, especially if you've never graphed the parent function before, the thing that you can always do is make a table. So let's do that really quickly. We're gonna pick specific x values and determine what their y values are. So we can start with an x value of zero, and then we're just taking the square root of zero, which is zero, since remember square roots are asking what number multiplied by itself gives you the thing on the inside. And we know that zero times zero equals zero. Now we can try an x value of one. So we want the square root of one. What number multiplied by itself gives you one? and that would be one. And we can try two, but there is no number or no rational number when multiplied by itself gives you two. Or in other words, if I do put in two, the square root of two is what we call an irrational number. It's essentially 1.41 and the decimal goes on forever. There is no pattern in this. It's a number that's similar to pi. And three would give us kind of a similar answer. It would just be this infinitely long decimal. So I'm gonna pick the value four since we can actually get a clean answer with that. So when we take the square root of four, the number that's multiplied by itself to give us four would be two. And we could keep going. We could also do the number nine. So an x value of nine, we want the square root of nine and that would be three. Now we could try negative numbers. So if I do negative one, then we want the square root of negative one. But the square root of negative one, there is no real number that when you multiply it by itself, you get negative one. And in fact, these numbers are kind of in their own category. We call these imaginary numbers and we give them the symbol i. But in other words, you can't graph this on the xy plane because this is simply dealing with all real numbers. So there are ways to graph imaginary numbers, but they're too advanced for this video. So for now, we just say that these numbers, these imaginary numbers can't be graphed on this coordinate plane. And that would be true for basically any negative x value. So if I did negative two or negative four, I would still get some multiple of the imaginary numbers. So basically any x value starting at slightly less than zero and essentially going leftward, all of these x values are not in the domain of this function. So there's essentially just nothing going to be pictured on this entire left side of our graph because for any negative x value, we get an imaginary number. So with that in mind, let's start plotting these points. When it goes through at zero, zero, at one comma one, and at four comma two, and at three comma nine, but you can get the general idea of this curve. And like I said, the domain just does not exist for negative x values. So we could say the domain of this equation or this function is starting at an x value of zero and going all the way to infinity, but it does not include any of the negative numbers. So with this in mind, with the graph of our parent function, let's start looking at a couple more advanced examples. So we can start with the equation y is equal to minus two times the square root of x plus two. And with all of these, what we first wanna do is figure out how is the equation transformed from our parent function. So this negative out in front, when we multiplied by negative one out in front, that's essentially gonna reflect all of our y values to the opposite side of the x-axis. So for instance, if you had this point, let's say three comma four, when you put a negative in front of the function, it's essentially just making the y value negative. So it'd be the same x value, but it'd be down at negative four. So that negative means we're going to reflect and we're gonna reflect about the x axis since all the y values are now negative. And then we look at this two in front and that's essentially multiplying all the y values by two. So that will stretch 
by a factor of two. So essentially all the y values will now be doubled. And then we look on the inside of our equation here and we have this plus two. But when dealing with the inside and essentially shifting the x values around, we know it's gonna shift it either left or right. And what I do is I ask which x value would you plug into this expression to make it equal to zero? And since for this equation, it would be negative two, that tells us we're gonna go left two units. So those three transformations will essentially take us from the parent function to this equation here. So I'm gonna quickly graph that parent function just so that we have it. And this is, again, it's just a rough picture. And basically I'm gonna pick a key point and see what happens to it based off these transformations. So let's look at this point here since it's kind of the boundary point. Though you could also look at maybe one one or four comma two, any of those points should work. But let's see what happens to this boundary point here at the origin. So first we know we're gonna reflect about the x-axis, but since this point is on the x-axis, or in other words, it's on the line of reflection, it's not actually gonna move at all. Now if the point was up here and reflected, it would end up down here. But since it's on that line of reflection, it doesn't do anything. So this transformation just happens to not affect this particular point, though it will affect every other point. And then we're gonna stretch it by two, so again, we're multiplying the y values by two here, but for this particular point, the y value is zero. So multiplying it by two doesn't change anything. However, if we're looking at the point one comma one, when we stretch it by two, it would double the y value and bring it up there. But again, for this particular point, the stretch by two just doesn't happen to affect it, though it would affect every other point. And then finally, we're gonna shift it two units to the left. So it's gonna shift over here, and since that was our last transformation, I'm gonna color it in that green color so that we know it's actually part of this graph. And I could do the same process for a second point. So let me do that. But you can also just plot a second point. Like I could put in an X value of negative one in here and essentially see what Y would be and then plot that. Because you really only need two points to get the general idea of this curve. But instead of doing that, I'm gonna follow through the transformations with the point one comma one, just to show you a second example of how that works. So first it's gonna reflect about the x-axis, so to bring it down here, and then we're gonna stretch it by two, so essentially doubling the y values, going from minus one to minus two, and then shifting it two units to the left, so over here. And since we've finished the three transformations, that point is actually a part of the graph, and we can now start to graph this. Though, if you want, you could plot a third point, and that might help get a better idea of how it's supposed to look. But since there's a negative, we know it should look something like that, because it's flipped over, and then we just essentially moved, we shifted it to the left and stretched it a little bit, but it's essentially this graph flipped over just a little bit steeper looking. And we could have also found the y-intercept just to get a little bit more accurate picture, but this graph will at least give you a rough idea. And if you're using the interactive graph on the Khan Academy exercises, you really only need two points and then the graph will essentially connect itself. So let's do a second and final example. And again, we're just gonna think about each piece individually. So this one half out in front, we're essentially multiplying the y-values by a half so instead of stretching, it's going to shrink the equation or shrink the graph by a factor of one half. And then we're dealing with this inside though, whenever you're subtracting X, what I like to do is essentially just rewrite the equation with the negative factored out. So I'd have one half times the square root of minus X minus three. And then I have plus one on the outside. And the reason I did this is because it's a little bit easier to see the transformations now. For instance, this negative is a reflection, though since we're dealing with the x values or the inside of the function, it's gonna reflect about the y-axis. Essentially, all the x values are now the opposite of what they were. And then we have this x minus three here, but again, when I'm dealing with the x values, I always ask, which value of x makes this expression, x minus three, equal to zero? And it'd be a positive three. 
So that tells us we're gonna go right three units. And then we have that plus one on the outside. So that plus one, since we're adding on the outside, we're just essentially shifting all the Y values up one unit. So to start this, I'm again gonna quickly sketch my parent function. And now that we have all of our transformations listed, I'm essentially just gonna look at this boundary point again at the origin and see what these transformations do to it. And again, the Y value is zero here. So if we shrink it by a half, that's multiplying the Y value by one half, but the Y value would still be zero. So this transformation does not affect this point. And reflecting about the Y axis, this point is on the Y axis, so it wouldn't actually be reflected. So this transformation does not affect this point. And then we're gonna shift it right three and up one. So we go right three and up one. So we can plot this point that used to be the origin is now at three comma one. And what I'm gonna do next is just plot a point next to it. So I'm gonna plot the point x equals two and plug that into my equation here. I get three minus two, which is one. The square root of one is one. So I'd have one half plus one, which would be three halves. So two and 1.5 would be a part of the graph. And I could plot a third point, let's say at x equals minus one. So when x is two, y is 1.5. And when x is minus one, if I put this in here, I get three plus one. So I get the square root of four, which is two, divided by two, which is one, and then plus one again would give me a y value of two. So at minus one, two, I also have a point. And now I can connect these with my curve. So this is my boundary point, and I know I reflected it about the y-axis, so I do expect it to go left and open upward, essentially. But remember, it's been shrunk, so that's why it doesn't grow quite as quickly as this one. So this will at least give you a rough idea of what the graph of this equation looks like.